The OPZ or OPZ is a really unique synthesizer sampler group box which understandably confuses a lot of people because on one hand it has a striking resemblance to a child's toy or a TV remote but on the other hand it apparently has the potential to make some really impressive sounds and patterns. I've been making a series of performances and tutorials for the last year or so based around mostly the OPZ uh, and I just wanted to answer once and for all the question in the comments and in my DMs, should I buy the OPZ? I'm not really into doing reviews or tech stuff so much, um, so this is a first for me. There's no sponsorship or affiliation in any way, obviously, but I usually like to focus more on the creative process and, and music itself. It's important to remember that at the end of the day, these are just tools that we use to make stuff, so don't get to fuss over everything. Um, that said, I just wanted to provide a rounded response that I can send to anyone asking this. Uh, and I thought that, that was easiest if I focused on the three main ways that this may be something for you or something not to buy. Uh, I also have a couple of other synths here that I wanted to mention uh, because the conversation always leads to other gear and gear alternatives. Reason number one why you should buy this thing is the elephant in the room, uh, portability. This synth is ridiculously small. Um, even compared to the Teenage Engineering OP1, uh, it is really small. Uh, I can take it with me anywhere. Uh, it's constantly in my backpack as a kind of just-in-case device so I can write a rhythm or a melody or a whole song uh, on, a, on a train trip uh, at the beach, in the mountains. I'm really into the outdoors and hiking, uh, so that's where I write and record most of my music. This was a really important factor for me personally and why I chose this as one of my first synths when I came to Norway. So you'll see in pretty much all my videos using this synth uh, around the whole country. Um, I've also done some experiments attaching it to guitars and, and other devices just because it's so small that with the form factor you can put it on the deck of the guitar and just have um, some fun combinations of having extra control with acoustic instruments or things like that. Obviously you can see there's no screen on this thing. Um, you can connect it to your phone or um, computer or tablet actually and this bring your own screen approach uh, obviously saves on a lot of space. Um, I kind of like that as well because once you know the synth really well it becomes quite intuitive that you can use these um, LED lights on the encoders and on the steps um, and combined with that and a bit of muscle memory you tend to not need the screen. It sounds a bit weird and intimate but I actually like to use this before bed sometimes so I'll just have it on my nightstand with a pair of small earbuds and so before I go to bed if I just want to write a drum fill or a chord progression or something then I can do that without opening up Ableton and having a bunch of blue light in my eyes so I can still fall asleep. Uh, reason number two is versatility. Um, it's hard not to forget at least one major feature while listing all of the stuff that this synth can do. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife slash jack of all trades synthesizer. So to start with, it can do sampling, uh, drums or any mono sampling on four tracks. It has uh, four tracks of uh, synthesis which includes uh, also polyphony, arpeggiation. Uh, there's also a series of uh, effects channels and effects tracks from regular choruses, delays and reverbs to um, uh, entire tape machine uh, master track for composing, like rearranging the key and mode, these punch in effects. There's also the possibility to control DMX, which is a light protocol if you're into that. And there's two main audio visual tools. One of them is Photomatic, which I have a dedicated video talking about since it had been upgraded. And that can use still images or videos in a sequence pattern uh, with some automation and, and effects to create uh, audio visual work. The other one is the video pack systems, which through some kind of weird, uh, insane wizardry can connect through your phone and use the Unity game engine to create 
a whole variety of things. So these range from audiovisual uh, video packs to things that have a lot of layers of interactivity and, and complexity. Um, that has a whole community of its own uh, that kind of deserves a nod. Uh, there is an inbuilt microphone uh, and the audio output also doubles uh, as an audio input if you have a, a TRRS uh, like headphone with microphone type situation uh, or you can use a splitter as well uh, or if you want the USB it doesn't just do charging it can do a lot. Uh, it can sync or send MIDI, it can send and receive audio, uh, or you can connect it to a USB keyboard like the Arturia Keystep, which the OPZ can actually power, by the way, on its own, uh, which is ridiculous. The USB port um, can also be used to rig up to other synths, like I use it with the Digitone, it's a nice combination. Uh, and uh, even, yeah, can be used to like rig individual MIDI channels to your door, like Ableton. Uh, I've been uh, doing a lot of that, and also another plug, I have a tutorial on that if that helps. Uh, they also have this uh, module slot for expansion. They don't have too much for the moment, but the, the big one is the Oplab module, which adds more ins and outs for connectivity in case you need that. You can have extra old school uh, classic DIN MIDI cables, or you can use CV to uh, sequence Euro rack or semi-modular gear. All in all, it can do really a lot of things. The third and final positive of the OBZ is the sequences complexity. I think one of the biggest shocks that I had when going through the list of features for this synth is, although it can do a hundred things, the sequencer kind of deserves a whole point of its own. Uh, so on this device, you have the 16 MIDI tracks technically, uh, and on those you can set LFO, pattern length, mute groups. You can uh, directly do pattern chains, pattern jumping, uh, which the Digitone uh, does not even do, another one of my sequences. Automation of every single parameter per step, customizable quantization, and then there are the fairly unique features of the step components, uh, the tape track. So these allow you to do a lot of live performance fills and also program in randomization. I know Electron has a lot of randomization built in and also 1010 Music is integrating the black box, Ableton 11 Live is exploring a lot with that. But there's something really special about the Spark components that I enjoy that just has a, a cool and unique feeling to it. It's uh, so fast and interesting that sometimes I like to use it uh, as a rig at home uh, to control Ableton in writing sessions just to get those, those extra ideas. This kind of MIDI sequencing power in the OPZ is fairly unique and it's something that even the uh, more expensive OP1 does not have. If you want to make never-ending ambient style music, this might be the thing. Now, I know I've just been singing praises about how much I love this synth, and I, I really do love it, but I think it's important to reflect on the downsides, like I said, and actually the three reasons that you shouldn't buy it are the same reasons that you should. So let's just go back through the same things with a bit more of a negative perspective. Because it's so tiny and portable, They've obviously cut some corners with packing everything into such a small box. That means on sacrificing, for example, the quality of the keys compared to the OP1 or a lot of other devices. So if you're expecting to shred, it's fine for me and I can play a little keyboard and uh, I know that there are some others who manage to play on there, but uh, let's, let's be real. When it's this tiny, it's gonna be hard, uh, especially if you got fat fingers. So that's, that's a challenge. Of course, you can add the external keyboard, like I mentioned, but then you're getting into the realm of it's not being so portable anymore. So you're bringing two things and then uh, that portable USP uh, is, is a different story. You can also do some tricks to extend your uh, patterns to have many more steps. But the way that the team at Teenage Engineering has gotten around having to uh, page scroll is that you're actually changing the resolution per step, uh, which is a confusing way of saying that you necessarily might not be able to see every step. 
Uh, and this is hard if you want to see everything, then uh, that's, that's something that's missing as well because of the size. Often I find myself uh, fiddling with the individual steps and I just end up deleting a bunch and re-recording a part of the pattern because uh, that's easier for me. Because of this choice uh, in development as well to go without a screen, I think there are ways that it can be cool if you know the synth already well, but one, if you don't, it's going to be a huge pain to learn, especially at the start. Uh, and two, again, if you want to bring your screen, it's going to be uh, something else that you have to connect to, something else you have to turn on Bluetooth and make sure is charged. So that can add a little bit to things if uh, you just need a screen and you need it all the time. Being so small and so light, uh, there have been comments about the build quality of this device that is a bit plasticky. Uh, personally, for me, I have been really lucky. I haven't had a single thing go wrong with my OPC, but I have heard a lot about uh, bending and warping from other people and also some popping encoders. Now, the popping encoders, I believe, can be fixed with a DIY tape hack of some description if you do need it. Uh, but the bending and warping uh, is apparently not ultra uncommon. So I can't speak for others, just myself. Uh, I'm really, really happy with my unit, but I believe Teenage Engineering may have addressed this in some kind of response about changing frame suppliers. So I don't know if that has been more helpful. That's something you might wanna look into. Now there's 10 projects as well that you can store and within those you can have a huge number of patterns but at the end of the day you've either got to overwrite or back it up which is fine. In terms of versatility uh, the disadvantage of any jack of all trades is that it is uh, known usually as a master of none other than the sequencer which is very badass uh, and the thing is you might want to ask yourself do I want something that can do everything or do I already have a bit of a rig and a setup and I just need something to do drum sampling or something to do synthesis or a dedicated hardware sequencer for my external outboard gear. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on other alternatives so that will make a bit more sense when we look at other options. For complex sequencing, this one isn't so much of a downside if you really know what you're doing. But even if you're an experienced producer with uh, music hardware, don't expect to take this thing out of the box and immediately be able to use all of the advanced features. If this is your first device overall, it's definitely really cool, it's really fun, but uh, give yourself a bit of time, cut yourself some slack. You're not going to be making infinite ambient loops with polymeters and polyrhythms and uh, key stepped arpeggios and, and all of these things. If you just take it one step at a time, it'll be okay, but you really do have to get through that period of being confused and accidentally pressing something and not being sure what it is. So if you learn how to go through the tracks, set steps, change your pattern lengths and resolutions, and then add the step components one by one, it's, it's gonna make sense over time. Uh, as I mentioned, I have some tutorials around this which may be helpful and obviously there's a lot of others from Cuckoo and many people on YouTube, so just use those resources uh, before you even buy them to make sure this looks like something that could be good for your workflow. So in summary, those three things, the portability, versatility and complexity, just be honest with yourself if you really need those things. If yes, it's ultra portable but you're going to be using it 99% of the time in the studio, then maybe you want to look at if something else is more useful. And if you already have existing equipment like a synth or a sampler, then maybe something else might fill the gap. But let's talk about that now. The most common question in every group and forum is, I have the OP1, should I get the OPZ or something like that? Should I get the OPZ or the Deluge? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, it doesn't matter as much as you think it does. If you want another similarly powerful groove box that has amazing sequencing, Electron has the Digitone, which I love. Um, really huge fan. It has a complex FM synthesizer and it's slightly larger, a lot more heavy, and that makes it less portable. It can be powered on an external battery pack, uh, which I do use but uh, it's, it's not impossible to bring uh, and the weight comes with advantages. So it's a little bit sturdy. It feels really, really solid and I've never heard anyone have any complaints about this thing. 
Although you can synthesize multiple sounds, including drum sounds simultaneously uh, and sequence them together, it technically has no actual sampling. So since it's missing that sampling component, uh, it's a little less versatile than the OPZ in a way. Uh, on the other hand, the Digitone has a partner called Digitact, you probably are aware of. And if you want something sampling based, but synthesis, real synthesis, is not as important to you, then maybe the Digitact is a good option as well. But if the depth and the power of your sampling and the depth and the power of your synthesis don't really need to go all the way in, then the OPZ might be a better option. Uh, speaking of sampling, there is a company called uh, 1010 Music that is making this very cool device called the Black Box that is getting a lot of upgrades. Um, it is a stereo sampler, which is a really big advantage, especially in this form factor. It's like extremely portable. You can sample uh, and record incoming audio live, which is really cool and fun. Uh, and it has really complex multi-sampling if you want to fake synthesis in a way. I'm not really a huge expert and some people are big fans, it kind of has a community, but there are limited buttons and a small touch screen, so menu diving uh, can be a bit of an issue, like on several of these devices. So maybe this is something to look into if stereo sampling is really important to you. If you want something similar to the OPZ, but slightly bigger, more solid, a more complete solution, then maybe it's worth looking at the MPC collection from Akai, like the MPC Live or MPC One series. Uh, they are pretty full on. They are really, really popular for a reason. Uh, obviously, huge hip hop history all the way back and modern reincarnations of those. It's almost like a DAW in the way that it has this very complete, uh, linear, big musical workflow and also gets a lot of expansions and, and things. But for me personally, at a certain point, I might just use a DLW. If I'm gonna have this big screen and this very typical workflow, then maybe Ableton or something similar is a better option for you. Especially if you don't have something like that, you're a beginner and you wanna have a bit of everything in one solution, then I would look at Ableton Live as a legitimate alternative. Mostly, at the end of the day, I just think the OPZ is useful for anyone who is creatively inspired by it don't overthink the rest. Thanks a lot for watching this video. I'll include some links in the description to tutorials that may help you if you're thinking about buying an OPZ or you already have one and you need some guides. And there are some free sample packs and other things. Yeah, have a good one.